I'm going to go through my bit, which is going to be an introduction about what we've been doing. And for the past, since 2014, when we actually started down this, this journey. And if we look at what we have been doing, people think, you know, people honestly think we've been doing nothing for years. And then we just come here and oh, we've got something to, to say. But no, it's been a, it's been a very long journey from, um, I, th I think the first thing is having an idea. And I think that's where all companies need to start with, with just having a really good idea about something that's a problem. Um, and, and what we did was, you know, if, if I go through each one of these is, is we, we, were, I mean, we were out talking to people, um, working for other companies, and what we realized was there was an actual requirement around um, application delivery for not just modern applications, but the legacy application stack. And there was a real conundrum around that, but also around the device that if I look around here, there's like various different devices from, you know, the iPads to, to Macs and to just normal laptops. And what we also have got is how many people have got mobiles on them and other devices. So, and, and the problem that I saw was we were getting asked all the time, how do we do this to a device which somebody will bring with them to a company and they will pull it out of their lap, their bag as a consultant and the company will go, oh no, you've got to use our company laptop. And so they would put their 17 inch MacBook away and um, get a, a Dell or something, or you know, a, just any old laptop. So what we did was we went through some early stages of concept and we found our chief development officer. And what we did then was, was realize that we needed to do something that was unique in the marketplace, where we could actually look at a single target which we'll go into to actually deliver the applications to, which is on everything that people have on their person today, if it's a mobile phone, a tablet, or a, a physical PC, or a Mac, whatever. So early stage sort of stuff, we looked at sort of the Chrome devices, because we had a project which somebody said to us, oh, could you do this to Chrome devices? And we said, yeah, well, we can do this to Chrome devices. So we started to look at the Chromebooks, and then what we realized was the Chromebook is a really nice tool. And I think everybody will know it's, it's huge battery life, very secure. And people were saying, but what we need is the other apps. We want the other applications which we can't get on the Chrome OS. We want the apps which are the Windows-based apps, the ones which are the Win32 apps, which have been written for, for education, for, for manufacturing, for automotive, for, for all industries. So then what happened was we said, right, let's, let's file some patents on this. We've got a really cool idea. Let's, let's get some patents in. And it was quite interesting because we say we're a container. We didn't actually go out and design specifically a container. Somebody had to turn around to us and say, actually, what you've actually built is a container technology. We actually called it a layer. So our, our patent actually refers to something called Layer X, which you have to make something up as a name. So, you know, and the, the patent attorney turned around to us and said, actually, what you've done is it's not a layer. It's a container. You need to refer to this as a container. So we then started to adopt, we are actually a container technology. And then we then started to say, actually, what, what can that actually do going forwards as a technology? Because we keep getting, at the moment, we get lots of people coming to us with different ideas. And what we're trying to do is get, be very focused on our launch, on just a, a very nice little launch with a version one product, and then move onwards. So... This was all behind the scenes. So then we started to do the universal build and then something happened. Somebody found our website and then decided to blog about us. Um, a little company called, does anybody know Chrome Unboxed, those guys? So they found us and all of a sudden, um, our mail server melted down because we were not expecting to get hundreds a minute of people coming onto the site and requesting more information and signing up for early access. So we, we, we were just not ready for that. You know, we, we tried to keep ourselves in stealth as much as you can, but you, you need to have some form of web presence. So from that, we had to accelerate very much where we were and we went to some early trials. And so the early trials were us going out and having a look at the market and actually trying to get some form of validation about 
is, is there a requirement? Have we, what, what we have got, is it needed in the, in the marketplace? What industries could we actually go to with this? And we found out it was, it was throughout all industries, which, which was, we were quite shocked about. We, you know, we were looking at various industries specifically, but when we went out there, it was across the board. So, and then what we decided to do was, right, we're going to come here and launch. You know, we're a UK company out of Birmingham. If anybody watches Peaky Blinders, that's where we're from. But, you know, we, are, we decided to come here and do it. So, <laughs> and what it enabled us to do was go out and get distribution agreements with the, the distributors. Like, we've got Prianto on board for the US and Europe. And we're looking at some others. And what we want to do is, is basically help companies get the applications that are problems onto devices which they want to put them on. And this is where the partner network is where we see those guys actually going out and doing the, the sort of work and finding out the apps, finding out what the problems are, and, and, and then using our technology to deliver them. So the validation was there was huge need across all industries. And I think, you know, if you, if you look at the problems that you've got today, um, we talk to engineering firms who have got applications which are sitting running CNC machines and they're being told they have to get rid of the machine that the application is running on. And they go, well, how do I run the half million pound CNC machine if that machine's got to go? So we're saying, well, hold on a second, what's the issue with the app? Is it the app that's the problem? Or is it the, the actual physical machine? Is it the security on the physical machine that's the problem? And a lot of the time they're being told, get rid of the old machine, but the app sits on that machine. And they just can't do it. It can't be physically done. So it's all, it's, it's MRI scanners. So we've got some people from the UK. If you go into any NHS in the UK, you'll find if you have an MRI scan, you'll walk straight past a, a HP, uh, an XP machine that's running the scanner. And this is, this is a massive issue because the, the, you know, people are trying to say the machines are security problems, but the apps can't be moved. And this is what we're trying to help people with. And there's, there's a, the problem is it's not just the normal apps, it's the bespoke apps as well. How do you take a bespoke app that's been written and then move it across to another platform? And this could be anything and you could, uh, uh, the, the list is endless. We've had um, analyst briefings where they've, they've sort of got to the point where can you actually do this where you can take the app and put it on a device and that device can be updated but the application remains isolated. And that's what they're really keen on. So, so this is part of the problem. You know, the problem is, is that as end users, as we are, I think I mentioned this yesterday to people, we, we are the edge of the network. We are, the, you know, we are at the end. We are using the device at the end of the network. And the problem is we're getting more savvy into what we want to use. People have choice. Consumerization is one. Does everybody believe in that? No. <laughs> no? <laughs> what are you using? Uh, I'm using a Lenovo, but what's a consumer model for an MRI machine? Yeah, no, but it's choice, isn't it? No, because the, the, the MRI machine, you can't really consumerize. You have to have the MRI machine with something on it. But consumerization is one from the fact that I, people want now to go out and buy the device <clears throat> of their choice. Yeah, I think consumer, it's not consumerization of the device. It's consumerization as a mentality. Correct. But it's, it's a choice thing. But people are more technically savvy now as well. They want, they want the Apple Mac. They want the, the iPad. They don't want the old Windows machine anymore. It's a bit like, you know, there's, there's the whole thing around CYOD, BYOD. You know, BYOD was a, a, a problem. CYOD was you get a choice. And most people, that, I remember having a choice of having a Windows machine or a Mac, and I chose the Windows machine because if I broke it, I know how to fix it. And the Mac, I didn't want to learn how to use it. Just, you know, if, but people have a choice, don't they? They can take the Mac and learn, or they can take the Windows machine. It's a choice. And it's phones, you know, mobile phones. Everybody has a choice on those. Most people, you know, iPhones, Android phones, I think those are the main two really now, aren't they? I don't think there's, there's much more of a choice you can go, but different flavors are available. So, 
So what we're trying to deliver is applications to any device. So you take the application and then deliver it to anything. So what we also want to do is deliver applications where you've got the security of the app, the information and the data. And the data is quite key to this because if you can, if you leave the data open, what's, what's the point? You need to actually make sure that you're following policy based on the company that you work for or the data that you're using. Whether it be in education, in government, in business, they all want the data secured. You know, there's all this, if you're in the, the GDPR sort of era, everybody's now getting doubly critical on data. You know, you've got to say, yes, I want to get receive information and I want to make sure that my information is, is remains secure behind locked cupboards. So what we need to do is make sure that's available. Also consistency and familiarity of applications. I have a question for you. Yes. Looking at that slide, it seems like you may have, uh, did you invent your own container runtime or are you using something from uh, the open container initiative? or probably not the Mobi project because that probably came after you guys started, but are you looking to leverage open source tools for your container platform? So we do use some open source, but we've done a majority of the work from the ground up. <clears throat> okay. So it's, it's our own technology. So it's, it's a case of, you know, there's open source stuff out there that's, that's really quite cool. But what, we've, we're, what we're trying to do is, is make it so we control the container and what can go on the container in, the, in such things like the operating system that you want to put on there for the kernel and you want to put other things in there. We want to control that. And it's also what the end user gets to see as well. We want to actually say, do you want, end users want the apps. You know, if you, if you give somebody an OS with no applications, what can they do? Mine Bitcoin. Install some apps. Mine Bitcoin, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And all they want to do is install apps, isn't it? You know, the, great, the greatest one was Windows 98 because everybody played Minesweeper. You know, but if you, if you keep going along and along, the games kept getting reduced. But everybody just wants the apps. The OS is just the delivery method for the applications. So if we can just deliver the applications and really have the OS hidden away, in theory, because a desktop is just there for somebody to start messing around. So I'm probably talking to the wrong audience here. So because everybody wants to mess around on, on, on devices. But what we're trying to say is just deliver the applications. And the application is the bit that the end users actually want. All the applications you have up on that slide have a native version for the devices that you're talking about. Correct. So the whole Office suite yep. got a native app for iOS and Android, yep. and you can run it in the browser <coughs> in Chrome. So <clears throat> would the droplet version of that run faster, be more efficient, more effective, or is it really about pack packaging up applications that don't have a native version? Uh, it's both. It's, um, let's say you could go to the mobile version of a productivity suite, or you can actually install the full version. Let me, let me maybe ask it a, a slightly different way, because I, I took something else from this, which is this is really a way to encapsulate applications that maybe can't be upgraded or can't leverage a native or, or updated version of an application. <coughs> so you essentially take that older version of the app, encapsulate it, and it could sit on a newer operating system. Correct. Is that? I, yes. Okay. I wouldn't want uh, a, the full desktop version of Microsoft Word on my Android phone because it's designed for a higher resolution, bigger screen with the keyboard, whereas the native app knows that I'm working on a smaller device with some restrictions around it. Correct. But the native app also, in a lot of cases, sucks compared to the full app. Yeah. I mean, that's a technical problem. <laughs> There's a <laughs> trade off that. Yeah, I, I, I think you say what you really think. <laughs> oh, camera's on? No, I can't. Just kidding. Um, well, yeah, I mean, obviously, if you look at Word on this and Word on a desktop, it's going to be a very different experience. Mm -hmm. um, but there are compromises even when you're on a 12-inch iPad with absolutely. the mobile versions. They're not the same as the full but fat versions that I have on my Mac. As we go through, I mean, especially in the enterprise, there's something to be said for application consistency, even across devices, where you're not having to create 37.6 sets of, sets of documentation mm. for, well, if you're running iOS on an S9, or I'm sorry, if you're running um, Word on an S9 versus an iPhone versus a 12.9 inch iPad, obviously there's some user experience issues there, mm -hmm. but there's also consistency in being able to, from a process standpoint. Plus, plus those mobile apps get updated at a much faster cadence than most desktop apps. Yeah. As soon as you've got your documentation and support 
in place, Are we it changes anyway. Paper? No, keep going. No. <laughs> I guess what we're discussing here is the problems that they're oh, trying to solve, aren't they? Yeah. No, the, uh, and, and you're absolutely right. You know, the phone on its own, would you want to really edit documents on it? But if I said you've got a big monitor here and you could put a Bluetooth keyboard against it, then what have you got? I think I, I've spoken to a lot of people about what's in a phone. And if you, if you, really, if you really delve below, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you about this because you all know, if you delve below the surface of a phone, it's got a processor, a graphics uh, card, it's got storage, it's got RAM. Now, hold on a second, that starts to sound like a laptop. But people buy a phone and they go, how many megapixels is the camera and can I have a different color? And that's it. You know, and what we're trying to say is the phone is capable of doing a lot. Why, why not use that power? It, and it, it's, it's a great fallback, a phone. <clears throat> but I wouldn't want to do a whole Word document on it, but it's, it's, it's capable of doing it. Is it capable of scaling? A, I thought there were, pro, pro, there were problems with scaling a, a phone's screen dimensions to a larger screen. I mean, we've seen, we've seen hardware vendors try to solve this problem by creating phone docks, and the experience is kind of bad, but how would your product address that? I think he can answer that when he, when he gets to his session. Okay. So, <laughs> when, and part of, I, I just put something on Twitter about that. My my mobile phone has a higher resolution screen than my PC from my ten years ago, <laughs> so it's it's just in a smaller form factor. So yeah, but I don't think the phone can drive a. Yeah, there is that. <laughs> the phone may be able to drive that amount of pixels, but I don't yep. think the software in it can can scale the application across the screen in a landscape mode. Will you be doing a demo? We all show some videos of some demos, yeah. Yeah, okay, that's cool. but if but if we're doing like the use case you said, where it's a, like it's XP and an MRI thing, and all you wouldn't need, do that on a yeah, I wouldn't put that on a mobile phone. But the idea is that I can take that app and put it on something which is you know, more, <laughs> which is different hardware, right. like, and yeah. that's what. No, I'm, let me, I'm let me ask it a different way. Hardware. The doctor's if, doing if, this. We can <laughs> run we can run Word on a mobile phone right now. Yeah, why aren't we already beaming it to a full res screen and attaching a Bluetooth Bluetooth keyboard to the phone? because technology is terrible and everything is broken. So um, <laughs> but can. the apps can't do it right now. You can, yeah, you can. You can do that You, you can. Yeah, you can. Yeah. If, yeah. You, can, can if you can get Bluetooth, Bluetooth to see yeah. on, on a large screen yeah, and it'll can, go yeah. across uh, the screen. Uh, uh, okay. uh, and on my phone, I can use the MyRecast too, the Intel MyRecast technology. So I can uh, share my mobile phone um, screen on any uh, TV or... Uh, mm. Any, um, Some sort of casting software. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've we've yeah. tried to use at where I work. We've tried to use Android apps on Chrome devices for digital signage. I know. You're <laughs> and it, the headache we constantly run into is you put it up on a beautiful display like that, and it's still the software still thinks it's on a yep. portrait mode phone. Yep. So that's where I was asking that right. question. I, okay. Just to clarify, is this two different? Uh, solutions or is the first example where you're talking MRI and those pieces is a very good example of what this can be used for? These are all examples of what this can go on. You know, you know we're not limiting what, what the end device is. What we're saying is, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm trying not to go ahead yeah. <laughs> and, and tell you some stuff that's coming up. Um, what we're trying to say is if you can put this on any device and we've got a common delivery method and the, the devices have got this delivery method, then what's the limitation? You know, the only limitation then is, would you, you know, the MRI scanner needs to connect to a machine somewhere. And that's why you wouldn't put it on, a, on an iPod or a, on an iPhone or anything. It's, it needs something to connect to. It's the same as the CNC machine. The CNC machine needs something to connect to, you know, rather than something that's mobile. You know, the mobile bit is, is just a, a, a really good example for somebody that's, we call it semi-connected technology. So you, you can be online or you can go offline. So, and that's the difference. I think the, the MRI piece and the CNC is a great uh, example to like kind of, to kind of capture people's imaginations because yeah. that's a perennial problem. Um, but then when you get into this area, there's, there's lots of people trying to do this, especially with those apps yeah. um, that you've got an example on there. And I guess just to your point about connecting to something, yes, I could containerize the app, but the, what about the drivers for that? serial connection or whatever to the CNC or the, yeah. that kind yeah. of like crazy whatever the MRI scanner is using. And that's, um, that's what you, and, and these are some of the problems we talk to people about. It's, it's a bit like they've got an XP machine and why aren't they changing it? Is it because of it's got some form of card that sits in it and if you go to a Windows 10 machine that bus isn't available anymore. Yeah. You know, so there's a lot of 
things that we need the <coughs> partners to go out and talk to these people about and say, what is the real issue? Is it the fact that the machine's not secure or is it the fact that you just can't move off it? Or if we can then move off it and to a newer machine, then can we encapsulate the software and just make it so it's never, it just sits in its own bubble and never updates because they see the XP bit is really insecure with the Windows 10 bit or whatever device they put it on is secure, you know, and, and gets updated. Exactly. I think we keep getting asked about that all, every single time. I would love to understand so. how it works. Like, yeah, you need to get to, to his section of it, yeah. Understand so. where, where it does the yeah. decoupling from the operating system, because there's going to be dependencies and stuff they're going to Correct. just didn't understand. The dependencies one is quite interesting because we talk about um, containerizing apps. Now, if you have more apps with dependencies to other apps, just contain them together. Well, there's also some that hook in the operating system in different ways and yep. things like that. That'll be really interesting to understand how you... I mean, a lot of us have tried to provide a similar functionality with things like um, ThinApp way back when. Yeah. You know, and I'm sure that, like me, people had very mixed success, yeah. mm -hmm. if yep. any. Hardware support. Yeah, um, this, this is quite a tricky thing to do. So I am... It sounds magic. <laughs> I am skeptical. Show me. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm to that Let's point too because I'm thinking, you know, uh, VMware Workstation, all these solutions with like Unity and the ability to install an OS and encapsulate and just limit the network access coming out of that. So there's a bunch of ways that we've tried to work around this in the enterprise. Some successful. <clears throat> So I'm not so much, so I'm I'm anxious to see how cool. how this thing works. Mm. <coughs> Java. <coughs> mm. <laughs> His presentation, you're gonna, yeah. Let's go. I think I should flip mine very quickly and get yeah. to his. So, so yeah. So we know we know there's a problem. I'm not gonna. These are some stats that I'll just throw up. It's always good to have some stats at some point around the proliferation of devices versus the operating system. So we know there's just an absolute mix of stuff out there. Um, you know, XP's I think sitting at around seven percent still. You know, it's not going away, and this is this is the big problem. You know, there's a load of apps out there that are still sitting around, and then this is the application conundrum. People want to stop because of the end of life. They, they've been told end of life application problems. So what we're saying is, okay, if you've got these problems, change the change the way it's delivered. So I think this is what we've been talking about. So I can actually go through these slides very quickly now, which is cool. So, so a lot of what you're describing on the right side, the container software. Fixes. Like that almost sounds sort of like Docker, but are you saying you just you're not tied into Linux then? So to actually run the container runtime? As in underneath? Yeah. We can sit it on whatever operating system you're on. Okay. Are you emulating like ARM instructions if if it, the app's running on a x86? Um that's his slide deck. Okay. And I don't want to start I'll, I'll thunder. <laughs> this is, it's, it's always great thinking ahead, but it's... Okay, I'll wait. Cool, brilliant. So, um, so this is what we want to do. So the legacy app <clears> I think we've been talking about is actually making it more mobile. Just, just, it doesn't have to be productivity suites. You know, it could be just a Win32 self-built app um, that people who designed it are just no, no longer around. But it's, a, it's an app that they can't get rid of. And we're finding more and more of those all the time. And people are sitting there scratching their heads. But they've looked at the other technologies. And they're, they're sitting there going, well, how do we do this? How do we deliver this? And I think it's a case of a lot of education around stuff. Because I always say there's a million ways to skin a cat. But what you need to look at is application virtualization, like ThinApp or AppV and all of those. And then see how do you get to as close to 100% as possible. It's always been a conundrum to get to that. And you just use whatever technology you, you can. And if we, if we can add into the mix, and we can take some of those technologies and add them into the container as well, we can start to change the playing field as well. Because if we can change the OS that's on the container, and you can deliver the app that's on the OS that it was designed for, that's a little bit more simple than trying to change the app so it sits on a newer OS. Just leave it there on that OS. So this is what we want to do. So how do we deliver this? So we wanted to do the universal delivery mechanism. We wanted to remove the dependency around being on the operating system. We wanted to remove the dependency <coughs> about being internet connected. So we call our stuff semi-connected technology. So if you're online, fantastic. But when you go offline, you can still be productive. 
You know, there's still the bits around databases. You know, if you've got an online database, don't think you're going to work. I don't think anybody solved that problem yet. Um, and then also remove the chipset off from the underlying device. So you, we don't need to be on a, an x86 or an ARM. We can sit on anything. So we can run it. I can run the same container on an iPhone that I can run on a Windows machine or a Mac. It shouldn't really matter anymore. And you can run ARM compiled apps on x86? Not yet. OK. So, so, and what we want to do is give the ability to just build up a portfolio of containers so an, in, so an administrator can just deliver these containers out to the end users very quickly. So they can build these containers really quickly and then actually deliver out, based on what the end user does, a subset of applications for them, which is just going to be the really easiest way for them to do it. And we keep coming across different initiatives with different companies and different governments around, like there's this whole greenfield, I think I was mentioning it to, to Michelle yesterday, there's this whole greenfield initiative, which is an end user being able to, they've not got a device, walk into any PC shop and pick up a device of their choice and have the apps delivered to that device. So, and them not being prescriptive on, you have to pick up this, just pick up something. So, and that's what we want people to be able to do. So people can walk in and say, I want to buy an iPad, or they want to buy an Android tablet, and, and they just go and get it, and just have the apps delivered as if it was on a Windows machine or whatever. It, doesn't, it shouldn't matter anymore. So, and people often ask us, you know, I think we've gone through this. Is it a cut down version? No, it's, it, is, it is the full version. We don't, we don't mess with the code at all on the applications. There's some people when I've gone to see them and I've shown them a, some stuff and they've said, okay, you're, you've changed the code and I've just given them a USB stick with the installer and said, install the app on your Windows machine. It's the full application. What, why, why change something? You know, I don't think there's a need anymore to change the application. Everybody wants the Adobe, I, I, I like everybody, every, what do I say? Everybody wants the Adobe Acrobat experience, but when they get the Adobe Reader experience, it's like having the sampler, but you want the main, the main, you want the main meal. So, and that's what we want to deliver. We want to deliver the, the full product. So what it also does is sort of cuts down on the amount of traffic that's flowing across the network. So what we can actually do is if you deliver it to the end user and we, we, we are really lightweight in our delivery mechanism, then what we can do is then say you work locally and then transfer the data back up. So, which is a bit of a swing from what people were being told was the only solution, which is to go to a cloud solution and do hosted desktops and, and suffer through the problems of you know, latency, bandwidth issues, and things like that. So we're trying to reverse it and turn the data center into a data center again, rather than actually a processing center. And I think, um, you know, the, it's, I, th I think VDI is great. I think app publishing is great. And what we want to do is work with, as, as a part of those sort of solutions, where if they say we want to work offline, then we have the application delivered to the end device. You know, there's a lot of companies out there that are saying multimedia redirection. Why not app redirection? You know, why can't we just say the end user has the app delivered to the device, so if there is a fluctuation on the network, they can just continue to work. I think that's a real bugbear for people when they're working on a, a hosted solution, when the network sort of bottoms out. So. so, we try and do VDI without the VDRI, is what I like to say. So, and what we try and do is actually deliver, we are, you know, we are delivering from the cloud you have to deliver from somewhere. So we deliver from the cloud to the device, and then you can sync back up to the cloud. What we try and also deliver is licenses for people to use all their devices. So you might get one user three licenses, or one user five licenses, but the difference is, is how many people use Office as a productivity suite? How many people use all their licenses? In Office? What do you mean? Yeah. 
I think Office has um, a, div a license where you can have five installs. Mm. Depends on how you buy it. Correct, yeah. And there's a lot of people out there that have bought it with five licenses and install it once. And that's it. So what we're trying to say is there is a, a way to actually consume some of your other licenses. You're licensed for it. You know? But you, you, there's other productivity suites out there that you can just run just as well. So we're not saying, you know, it's, it depends on what the end user wants to run. So, sorry, in that example, are you saying that you need a license, the original vendor license for every device you're going to run this on? So it, with that example, if I wanted to run it on six, a six device for my office, then I need to yeah. go and get a license for that. Correct. We don't, let's say we're an empty, if you think about it, we're an empty container. You have to have licenses for the applications that you run in that container. So, so long as you've got a license, it's fine. But it's up to you to policy those licenses going in. But do you, do you, I mean, how do you overcome that for applications that aren't typically licensed for multi-users? So if you're talking about some of those legacy applications and those pieces, they're, they're one license, um, and you're now providing that access to that to multiple devices. How do, you, how do you reconcile that? Do people then have to go out and buy yeah. the licenses for every device? And do you limit the amount of devices that that could run, to, run on? Yeah, well, well it, it's a bit like what, when you have three licenses, once your third license is consumed, you can't download the container anymore. Then what you have to do is if you change a device, then you have to say, remove the device from the license pool, and then you can add it to a different device. It's a bit like we're trying to control the license is getting delivered down. The container, is, I think Fabian will go into this, but the container, everybody can download a portion of the container, but it's not until they get the license they get the full container downloaded. So you can have it on multiple devices, but you need a license for it to run. And when the applications go on, you do need a license. Is that a droplet computing license then, or the application license itself? Well, you need a license for our container, but you also need a license for the application that runs for every, you're streaming that app, so it's every... Well, Correct, it's really everything, it's everything, every app that's delivered to your device will need a license. We faced the same issue when Citrix first came out and people were postulating that they could buy the number of licenses based on their concurrency. But as soon as server-based computing became popular, all the software vendor li um, vendors changed their license policies that said you needed whatever it was for the number of seats on your network. So the chance of saving money by only buying the licenses for the concurrency just evaporated yeah. overnight. So, so at the end of the day, whatever the application delivery mechanism is, the person delivering the app doesn't control a licensing policy. Of yeah, but it's of that vendor. one to many, like with Citrix, I'm, I'm one person logging into one device and that's where my licenses are. With this, you can say, well, I can, I'm one person, but I've got a laptop, <coughs> my iPhone, my iPad, mm. my computer at home. My, and when you're talking about this, I've got my TV, I've got all these other things then suddenly you might hit a, a, a license problem or a licensing that you haven't encountered in the past because suddenly all these things need to be multi one right. user to multiple devices the, the, I, I get the sense you probably don't control for every licensing nuance that's out there you're gonna have you're gonna depend on it to put some semblance of control in place correct. there's licensing based on user there's licensing based on device there's licensing based on if certain applications cores and then there's ones that say we will not allow you to run this in a virtualized environment, yes, in 2018. Um, and so you're not going to be able to control for every licensing nuance, I would imagine. The, as we're an empty container, the license control mechanism is not down to us mm. because we're not doing software asset management. What we can do is we, we do, you know... Can you integrate with key server or something like correct. that? Correct, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we, can, we can integrate with other technologies. So once you have it delivered, then the license can sort of take whatever it needs from a license management server, if you have something like that. But it, it depends. Most, you know, some of the applications we, we are talking to people about, they don't even have the install media anymore. And this is, you know, so, and this is the problem. You know, you've got people want new apps and there's different license <coughs> methodologies to the old apps. So what we've got to try and do is actually say, if it's a new app, we'll take the license from somewhere. And if it's an old app, how does that license go in? It, it could be a, somebody manually inputting a license key, which right. is the old way, isn't it? So. But I think Chris's point is a valid one in the yeah. sense that if you were doing this through conventional virtual desktops, you install that software once you pay a license for it, 
and then you connect to it from any number of devices you've only paid for one license. Whereas with this model, the software vendor could say you've now got it installed to three devices and you've only got one license, so you're having to pay more. Like, I, is that your point, really? Isn't it, it is, but I think actually thinking about it, it's a nice problem to have and it's, yeah. it's not necessarily for you guys to solve just because you can now run that on any device you like. It's like you need to go off and work out the licensing implications of that because you've now got this cool new delivery mechanism. Yeah. But you guys are just enabling that. There, the, there is an also sweet irony that if the vendor who provides this software no, no longer exists, <laughs> who do you pay? <laughs> well, there isn't anybody point, to Oracle. revenue anymore. <laughs> Oracle. Oracle. Oracle will figure out. The funny ones about licensing are when, when we get the people who have got a cupboard full of old office and old XP and they've upgraded and they're now going, what do we do with all these old licenses? Because they bought them, they own them, and they're going, what do we do with them? And we're sort of saying, they're saying, we would really like to run them. And we're saying, well, why don't you? And they say, because we're told we've got to go to Windows 10 and it won't run. And we're saying, okay, well, just run them. And there's, let's say, people wanting to run Office 2003, 2007, it's out of support. And we're saying, well, just install it and just run it. It's a word processor, it's Excel and it's PowerPoint. You know, the only difference is it doesn't look as nice as the newer versions, mm. but it still does exactly the same functionality. You know, it might, it might not just be as cool as the new versions, that's it. But people have got these, they're sitting around. You know, a lot of people are sitting around on thousands of licenses and not doing anything with them. Would so. it be possible one way to get around the issue that Chris is bringing up that if the container is a disposable um, object, yep. is that when you're done with it on the iPad, you dispose of it, and then when you move to a different device, you're still consuming, consuming one license. The container is discarded once you're finished running the app. Uh, I guess the size of the thing to download might be uh, yeah, the that's, biggest prohibitor it, to that. It's, that's the limitation. Like Office is a gig to download. Yeah. So if you want to do it and then wipe the cache, it's no longer on that device at all. And you're going to have to re-download it every Correct. time you want to use it. Yeah. yeah. But it, the smaller applications are really simple to download. They're, they take seconds, if not minutes. Exactly. But then you've got <coughs> the ability to then wipe the cache. So very, there's, very two, there's two sides of this, isn't it? Correct. There's the legacy applications and trying to extend their life, but also trying to make this technology be a, a method of delivering applications for a future, for a world where everybody is bringing their own device and you have no control over the endpoint. Correct. Well. Yeah. So, and this is where we get to to this. So, this is what we're trying to do: is is actually take the application, set it free, and actually deliver to any device. And to your point around running it on a phone, you know, we are testing with actually using things like the <coughs> AirPlay and the, the casting sort of technologies. Um, Fabian's been toying around with a nice little Bluetooth keyboard I bought for him with a trackpad, which actually on an Android phone, it shows the mouse running around on an, iPhone, on a, on an Android phone, which is, which is in theory what people want. You know? So if we can upscale it to, a, and everybody has, I don't know what size this, TV, this, this is, it's very big monitor, but I would love that at home. I'd have to sit a long way away from it to actually be able to see it, but uh, it would be a brilliant monitor to have and a Bluetooth keyboard and just have my phone next to me. What we're also going to do is try and have the phone so the phone's actually your mouse. So you can use a, a, a trackpad or you can use the phone as a mouse. It's a touchscreen. Mm. So why not use it as, a, as what, it, what it's for? You know, just have an overlay over it. Yeah. Uh, I have two questions. How do you manage uh, the white space or the roaming situation with your product? As in the size of the screen versus? No, because um, I'm French. If I use your product, how can I manage uh, the roaming? Because uh, I won't have uh, enough data to, uh, to share all, uh, all applications. I don't think so. On what device? If I, if, if I have only my, my, my phone. Yep. Okay, I don't have my laptop. Yep. So with, with your product, uh, uh, I can share a, any uh, any, applic any of my application on any devices. Yep. Okay, but I'm related to the cloud. Yep. So I have to pay my connection, my data connection to the cloud. Correct. Okay, but when I'm abroad, how do you manage it? Am I on cash on my uh, on my phone? Correct. Or? Okay. And the phones, you know, you're sitting on your phone work. Fabian's going into the file structure about where we store things on, on devices. And what that will mean is, what sort of phone is it? Samsung S9. Has it got a 
micro SDs. Yeah. So, so you know, you can extend the sort of storage on a phone and make that the place where we can actually store the data or the application. Yeah. Yes and no, Correct. because when I'm abroad, I use two SIMs, so <laughs> I, I can't. I have to choose between yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, extending my storage or uh, yeah. between two SIMs. We, we try and keep it. You know, we're trying to keep it very, very lightweight. So the container is very, very lightweight. Okay. The application is the thing that will take. Depending on what application it is. Yeah. You know, if it, if you want to put, let's say, some of the big productivity suites in, that's a gig. So if you've got a gig of space free. Fine, but if you haven't, then it, that's the limitation. You might have to say Sims or yeah. extended. But how much storage has that got on it? Uh, 60, uh, 64 gigabyte. Yeah, so that's still quite a lot. Are you using it all? Or? No, the, currently no. Yeah. So and, and this is it. The phones are coming out now with more and more storage on them. So which is which is really enabling us to actually put stuff onto a phone. Yeah. Can I ask, <clears throat> I mean, packaging and delivering the app is one part of the equation, but around that there's a whole entitlement process, but also decommissioning process. Yep. So if I use this to deliver apps to contractors who are bringing in their own devices, yep. is there a way of me saying that that app only has a certain time yep. to live, or I can decommission that app and it won't work anymore, it'll delete itself? Kill pill. Kill pill, yeah. Yeah, so okay. we can do that. Ooh. It's it's one of the first things that we would when we discussed when we were in the universal builds, mm. which was how do we deliver this so we can kill it after seven days or a month or six months or twelve months. So they have to check in every so often in order to keep the software Correct. running. So if they just walk off sign, it'll eventually die. It's it, it's also the fact that somebody could go away and lose a device. Mm. Um, somebody asked me the other day if they they installed it on an iPhone and lost their device. I said, well. You surely you just wipe the device anyway through mm. through Apple. Yeah. So, Find my but, yeah, yeah, yeah. So but we, we can actually put a kill pill in to say you can have the container for seven days and then after seven days, unless you check back in, it doesn't update the license file and then it, it just will just die. It will lock mm. and then it'll die after another couple of days. It's just control. Mm. And you know, this is where an administrator can go in and set some form of policy around this. Which is what you need, you know, because mm. everybody's different. Everybody wants different apps. You've got to be able to say these are the apps that people get and these are the apps that these, these people don't get. Mm. And these people get them for seven days and these people get them for a month. And that works with both people who are part of some sort of Active Directory open LDAP domain, but also for people who are domainless. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit like we can give a just all we need is an email address. Right. So somebody can put an email address. And they we'll sign it, up. Correct. And if it's, um, let's say, a large organisation, we can do it probably, you know, just via a domain mm. and give them an unlimited key. And then it's up to them to police how many licences people are downloading of the container to put mm. applications on. We don't want to we don't want to restrict people if they've got thousands of users. What we want to do is enable them. To, right. To, to con just to consume. So. So that's where we want to go. We want to go to everything. We don't want to limit what people can use this on. So, and I suppose the, the big thing is, is around, people always confuse us with a lot of these. Oh, you're doing the same as what these guys are doing. But, and you're, you know, we're, we're doing VDR, we're doing app publishing. A lot of companies actually turn around to us and say, you've just downloaded that from a server, so you're remoting it. And then we just turn it on airplane mode. I think that, that sort of gives them the impression that we're not remoting it anymore. Um, you know, these, these technologies are great. I, I say all of those are brilliant technologies and we want to work with all of them. You know, the, the app layering sort of technologies, we want to work with those guys. We, we already have started testing around like Cameo, AppV, ThinApp, about packaging the apps. If people have already got them as MSIs, executables or packaged applications, we don't want people to just reinvent the wheel. Use them what they've got, already got, just to deliver what they've already done. And if there's any other applications, deliver those differently. It just makes sense. I just want to give time back to administrators. It's, and I suppose that's the one thing that administrators don't have today, is time, because they're just consumed with doing lots of other things. So, and that's our target. That's what we want to deliver to. We just need a browser. <laughs>